United Against Cancer. Thank you, Nancy. Amazing response. And it shows that this is where your passion is. And uh, the, the difference between awareness and advocacy uh, is really very interesting to note. I know that you are an advocate, you are an, a very ardent advocate. You advocate for better clinical trials. You work in on the clinical trials themselves, on government policy, like you rightly mentioned, sometimes we have to do it in a roundabout way. Uh, even though you have a seat on the committee, uh, there have been so many instances. And then you brought about the very important issue of working so together with government in a way that will be productive. And um, I, 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 I like the fact that we're talking about this now because one thing that has been on my mind, uh, we're now global, we're talking global here. Uh, this is a global platform. And we can see that uh, the United States of America is going through an election process. In the last, should I say three years, the cancer moonshot uh, initiative of President Biden has been very popular and um, spread across the globe. So how much of an election issue is this today? How are our advocates making sure, how are we going to make sure that the Cancer Moonshot Initiative continues into the next government? This is not about who wins or who yeah. loses. It's about what is going to happen to the initiatives. I have been in that shoe uh, from the Kebi State uh, transition into today. The passion with which some of those projects are being driven is missing. And um, it's, I would say that how do we ensure that we can sustain some of those programs? This is a very big question. I, I don't expect <laughs> you to answer it, but I just thought I would yeah. drop it there. <laughs> yeah. So my, I think the Cancer Moonshot is one of the most, um, you know, phenomenal, you mm. know, projects that the U.S. government through Joe Biden has really been pushing for the past few years mm. but I would really believe that I have done a research I've done a paper on cancer moonshot not published anyway but I did some kind of understanding what exactly cancer moonshot have really done over the years and what it's been projected to do um, the reality of what I'm seeing from cancer moonshot is cancer moonshot is strictly a, an American initiative, but mm -hmm. interested in solving a global problem. So while Cancer Moonshot is really exciting and really have been making and funding a lot of initiative, not just in the US, but across the world in trying to end cancer as we know it. I mm -hmm. think Cancer Moonshot to some level have been institutionalized. Mm. And this is my own opinion. I don't think who wins the U.S. election may have like a lot of impact. It may have some, maybe not a significant impact on maybe like scrapping the initiative totally, but I think maybe it may reduce the funding. However, but I think the cancer moonshot has really become something that. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone will want it to really be missing in any U.S. government budget, you know. Mm. But my own level of uh, my own level of advocacy right now is that I think African countries, many low and middle income countries, need to begin to think about the African cancer moonshot, or about mm. Asian cancer moonshot. You know, why can't we, as a continent, also have our on moonshot. Mm. The reality is that let's think about this from the biggest problem facing cancer. The biggest problem facing cancer, I can tell you, my right now is cancer funding. Global funding is not there. And that is mm. what Cancer Moonshot is doing that is changing the landscape. 
Uh, number two biggest problem is the cancer workforce. Number three is low research. Number four is blaming cancer patients for cancer. So if you think of this, my own personal analysis, you would really see that if different continent, for instance, um, the global fund that we all are celebrating and really delighted how it has changed the faces of HIV, mm -hmm. tobacco, and other disease, right? The global fund was first initiated by Kofi Annan, an African. In fact, the $100,000 that he won as a prize in Philadelphia, he donated it to global fund because he wanted and said, we need a fund that can really care and support so this issue. Mm. <laughs> Patients living with HIV. Mm. Now, this fund has become a catalytic fund that mm. is raising millions of dollars every single year for these diseases. Why can't we have a cancer fund? You know, why can't we have a cancer fund? Because I believe the global fund is just more like a replica of cancer moonshot, but you know, slightly different because the US. Mm. Why can't we have that in Nigeria? Why can't we have that across Africa? Why, why is it that African Union, for instance, cannot set out a fund and say, hey, we have this and we want everyone to, to donate into this. We have so many millionaires, Tony Elumelu, who even donate to these funds. Absolutely. In those countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have them. They donate to this global fund. You know, so it's, it's a lot of things to really unpack on how institutionalizing a policy will not really impact, you know, whichever government that comes in. Yeah. Very interesting perspective. Thank you for that, Ransi. Uh, do we hope for the best for both US-based <laughs> programs and more funding generally for cancer? Uh, yes, we do have a lot of um, very philanthropic people out of the African continent, contrary to the belief that um, Africans do not have that ability. But there are philanthropic that give altruistically and uh, are making uh, a good way for funds like Global Fund, Gavi, I know, and so on. So interesting, and we hope to see many more of them. Now, the sa we save the best for last. <laughs> Let's talk about the, your work, which holds around World Cancer Day every year. It's an amazing work. It's an award-winning work. It's a published work. It's a researched work. And um, there's so many aspects to the World Cancer Day work that um, is held by Project Pink Blue. I don't miss it. Uh, there are times when even Rossi is unable to attend. I am there. So <laughs> it's, it's a fun work. Tell us about the work. Tell us about the prizes you have won and what, what stimulates you and where do you see it's going next? What is the biggest achievement of that work? A little bit about the work, the biggest thing that you achieve every year that you feel that this is why I will keep going. And where, what is the next step? Where do you see it going? So we need to hear about it first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, I would really say that um, for a very young person like me, um, and I think for most young people across Africa and across many you know, marginalized countries and, you know, um, you know, countries that are really battling with so many things. Uh, some of the challenges that young people like us who want to be change makers in our community face is you see a problem, you want to solve the problem, but you're not finding mentors mm -hmm. or you're not finding people that look like you that are doing what they are doing and that are willing to support you. So those are the kind of problems that most young people face. And when young people face this problem, sometimes people don't even understand the depth of this problem. And this is why I am so appreciative of, you know, someone like you for the impact you made in my life when in 2013, I was doing my national youth service. I saw the work that you hosted 
I saw the different events you did. I participated in it. And I came to you and I said to you, Ma, please, I think it was uh, Abubakar I sent the message and I said, Abubakar, I want to meet with you. Um, and let's, let's really understand that, you know, it, it's very difficult to meet with you because there are so many demands on your time. But I sent that message and Abubakar reached out and said, hey, your excellency is really willing to meet with you. Mm -hmm. And we met our first meeting. I remember I can just get the flashes on my on my face. And we met for the first time. That was just a few days after your walk. And I told you exactly the question you are asking me now. That I asked you these same questions. What has been the impact of this work that you are hosting? And how can I replicate this? Do you know that many people who do not imbibe many leaders like you, many Many amazing people like you who did not imbibe the spirit of collaboration, the spirit of mentorship, mm -hmm. will not answer that question, will not encourage me to replicate the same thing you are doing. Because you would probably see me as a competitor. Mm -hmm. But Your Excellency, you did not do that. You saw me as a collaborator. You encouraged me and said, hey, this is how we do it. <laughs> you can you can even innovate and add something to it. And that is the beginning. That is the beginning. That is just how the World Cancer Day work started. <laughs> you know, they remember the first of the work that we did was in 2015. And it was phenomenal. And we sent a letter to you, you know, <laughs> meditate. <laughs> Asking you, asking you, I mean, it's a funny, very funny letter, but you, you can see the passion in the letter. Asking you to support the work that we wanted to do. You know, so many people will feel like, no, 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 we don't need a competitor in Abuja. But, we, but you supported the work that we did, and we hosted that 2015 work. And since then, it has just been amazing. I would really say uh, some of the secrets of the success of the work is that we have worked so hard over the years to sort of hide the name Project Pinglu out of the work and just promote the World Cancer Day more. So when mm. people see the work, people see the posters, people see all the things we do about the World Cancer Day, they see the World Cancer Day work more than even the organization that is hosting the event. So even on our T-shirts, on everything we do, Project Pingu is always taking the back seat, but the World Cancer Day takes the front page. And we learned over the years that this has made the community to own it. Abuja people have owned the World Cancer Day. So um, once it's getting to December, people have already started messaging us and like, hey, I hope you are yes. planning to work for next day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So people have really, really owned the work, and we have learned over the years. We have integrated research into it because we realized that um, if you don't do research, you will not really understand the impact of the work. And we are so grateful for Union for International Cancer Control because the UICC is actually the organization that really initiated the World Cancer Day work, the World mm -hmm. Cancer Day in general. Mm -hmm. And we're also very grateful to them because they have also promoted it. They have mm -hmm. also supported it. And I would say UICC have been doing an incredible work, very fascinating work, you know, Carrie Adams and, you know, the UICC World Cancer Day Advisory Board has been driving the World Cancer Day in a way that is a, it's no longer just a, a, a platform driven by UICC. It's now a global, truly global, opportunity mm. Mm. for the world to mobilize action against mm. cancer, to mm. launch different initiatives, to mm. engage with their policymakers. In fact, we, through the World Cancer Day, have seen Vice President of Nigeria tweet about World Cancer Day. Mm. It's mm. a phenomenal impact, and mm. we hope the UICC will continue to promote and encourage member organizations and other organizations across the world to do, um, you know, 
World Cancer Day activities. So we're looking forward to doing more, more <laughs> events. <laughs> and I'm really hoping it will be a platform that will continue to inspire communities, inspire people to lead the change that they want to see in their communities. In their communities. Well, thank you so much. Very interesting. And the, you know, your face, the way your face lights up, I can see that this is something, we know that you're very passionate about this. And I'm sure those that are watching are going to also feel the same way. Now, finally, let's talk about the support groups that you are so involved in and that you have not put together. Um, I chair one of the support groups, the Network of Persons Living with Cancer, and it's a very, a very gr a group that touches me a lot. When they reach out to me sometimes, can we have a meeting? I'm like, anytime, I can have a meeting for you, because these are all champions. You choose to call them champions, people that are struggling with the disease and all the complications of cancer, but they find time, they want to give back, they want to do something, they come together, support. So who are we not to support them? And thank you, Ronsi, for the work that you do in that um, area. Tell us about the support groups and how much more you've spoken about this person's living with cancer uh, and how they need to be part of the conversation uh, more at the table where decisions are being made and not just take decisions on their behalf. In fact, the WHA uh, this year may declared there was a declaration that social participation has to be more active across all sectors of disease. So wh where do you see the support group going? Why do you do it? And um, a little bit more information about the logic behind it. Yeah, so I... You know, and I am really, I'm really, really excited to share this story because, um, and that's why I love UICC a lot because UICC has really touched my life greatly. Um, in 2016, I traveled to UICC World Cancer Congress in Paris. <laughs> you know, after UICC have provided a $57,000 grant to Project Pink Blue to start up patient navigation in 2015. So we traveled to Paris to share the impact of the work that we're doing as at then. And when I arrived at this conference, I saw so many people. I saw so many people. I saw so many cancer patients in the UICC patient pavilion. Whoever that brought that idea is just an excellent idea. In the patient pavilion, only patients just come around and sit and chat and discuss. I looked over in the pavilion. I saw that all the patients there, no one looked like me. There were no black patients. Very few black patients came around later, but they were all based in the US. They were all based in the UK. They were all based out of Africa. So I asked myself a question. Why is it that we don't have cancer patients from Africa in global events? Does it mean we don't have cancer survivors? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that my flights from Paris back to Nigeria was filled with lots of emotion. I was literally crying within myself, like, we need to change this path. We need to get cancer patients be the voice that they want. We need to get them out. And that was my meeting with you when I was telling you. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> he came back from Paris, came to me and yes. said, how can I get the survivors? Where are they? Are they online? <laughs> Where is that like? <laughs> yeah. you know, At the time, it wasn't so popular. Exactly. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. And then I came back to Nigeria. I was so frustrated. And I reached back to UICC. I said, hey, we need to do something more drastic. And they said, well, we can support you. They connected me to a lot of other cancer survivors, other support groups across the world. And I said, okay. I started drafting documents to create a support group. And I was so happy as I then, I had a survivor who works with me. She was a bit skeptical whether to come out or not. I keep encouraging her. One day she agreed, for, um, you know, to a blessed memory, um, you know, um, Madam Madam Khadija Banwu. Yeah. Uh, she has been working with me for over nine years. We've just mm -hmm. lost her in February. Mm -hmm. um, Madam Khadija, we said, okay, maybe the best thing is for us to hit the hospital 
hissed the TV. We started going to the hospital to encourage patients to come. And then that was how we found Gloria Oji. Uh -huh. We recruited Gloria Oji in, in, 20, in 2015, 2016, we recruited Gloria Oji, 2016. And when we recruited her, we gave Gloria Oji an Etisalat mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Recruited Chuk Sibokwe, a male breast cancer survivor mm -hmm. who heard my voice on TV. And we gave him an Etisalat mobile phone to start the first patient navigation and say, we want you to speak. to." So if anyone call me, I will push the call to you and you don't have to pay for it. Project Pinglo will pay for that call. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started. And then we started with the group. Gradually, Swat Gimba joined us. That's four people now. Mm. Gradually, <laughs> <laughs> gradually, we added more people. From that 2016 to the 20, don't forget, it's the end of 2016 to the beginning of um, 2017, we've, we're about seven. Mm. And then on the day of the event, World Cancer Day, and I talk about UICC, World Cancer Day, UICC actually encouraged me and said, you could launch, the name of the person who did is Marina, Marina Tihon. She was the one who was running uh, UICC um, um, SPAC, MBC, Metastatic Breast Cancer <laughs> SPAC program. And we launched the support group, you know, on the 9th of February at Transcorp Hilton of in 2017, Abuja Breast Cancer, that was when we launched it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bello was there, Ramatu Hassan of the Federal mm -hmm. Ministry of Health, such an amazing woman, one of the best mm -hmm. that we've mm -hmm. ever had working with the government, you know, very, very passionate mm -hmm. and understands how CSO will work. Mm -hmm. So that's how the whole journey went. And we had the first, the first breast cancer support group in Abuja mm -hmm. with nine patients. And immediately we launched it. I hands off. I say, Gloria, oh yeah, take off. You're going to be the president. I'm not a survivor. I should not be leading this. You lead it. We'll only support you from behind. And I can mm -hmm. tell you, Gloria have done a phenomenal work. Mm. Then in 2020, mm -hmm. we started getting a lot of, before 2020, we started getting a lot of backlash. Men were fighting us. They were like, you guys, what about, we have colorectal <laughs> cancer. We have prostate cancer. Why are men not allowed to be part of uh, the breast cancer support group? So we expanded it and call it the network of people impacted with cancer. With cancer. And mm -hmm. today I can tell you we have over, we have over 300 uh, cancer patients are part of the network. Mm -hmm. We've set up the Abuja part, we've set up Lagos. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working on uh, setting up Kano. We're also working on setting up another one in Northeast. The goal, it's not really for me to own any breast cancer support group. The goal is that mm -hmm. patients really have the passion, but they don't know how to start. Mm -hmm. So we have CSO leaders that already know how to start this kind of thing. We need to just support them, empower them, and have them run, run their thing. You know? So that has been my journey with, the, with, you know, with, with, with support group and empowering cancer patients, having them to be the voice. And I'm really, really, really excited that it's really making a huge change across the country. And I hope I hope the champions continue to drive those process. I hope so. Well done, congratulations. Amazing, amazing achievements. Uh, indeed, this, you need to be in the area, or should I say within the country to be able to feel the impact of what uh, the support groups that you instigated after being stimulated by a trip to the World Cancer Congress uh, by the UICC initiated and it made you go on. And today it's really a, a network and so many cancer champions are able to do sometimes when he comes into either the walk or an event with all of them it's like my god it's so fulfilling and amazing so congratulations Ronsi you so um much. you are an amazing person the work that you're doing is truly truly remarkable you have grown into a a, a, an, a young old man because <laughs> you're a young man with so much experience in the space of this time because you have done the walk. You have walked it and you have done it and you got your hands in there and did it. And um, 
so proud of you and I wish you all the very best. I don't know if you have any parting shots for us, uh, but if you have any wrap-ups that you would like to make, please go ahead and do so now. Okay, I think the last thing I would want to say is to really appeal to um, the global community, appeal to physicians, appeal to oncologists, surgeons, and global healthcare leaders to stop blaming cancer patients. Stop blaming cancer patients for presenting late. Stop uh -huh. blaming cancer patients for presenting stage four. Rather, blame the cancer healthcare system that did not fix the system to help them to present early. When we fix the system, patient will definitely present early. And let's not forget, many cancer patients present early, but the system failed them. Mm. Until we are able to really, really understand that blaming cancer patients will not solve the problem, we will continue to go round around these issues around cancer. Finally, a cancer patient in Kuala Lumpur, a cancer patient in Kazakhstan, in Geneva, in Texas, in Lagos, Nigeria, is the same. What differs is what they have access to, what mm. they are able to afford, and you know, what is available to them. So if we want a truly, 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 truly global cancer control, it's so important to ensure that global cancer control really think in this direction. Understanding that cancer lives matters, cancer patient lives matters, but also, you know, the leadership and all the different aspects of who drive this cancer conversation is very, very crucial. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ronsi. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I wish you all the best as you continue to progress in your career and impact the lives of people living with cancer. Thank you. My last ask is for you to say with as much emotion, this is very emotional now, <laughs> as you can muster at this point, please say, United Against Cancer. United Against Cancer. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.